friends, brothers and sisters from the diaspora. Good afternoon. Welcome to the New Gambia. That is our slogan. And believe me, Gambia is back. I am pleased to receive you here today as friends, family members who came together to make this change. Believe me, I have said it all the time. Without you, it would not have been possible. You fought very hard. Use your resources, time, the social media, the WhatsApp groups. You did it all for the Gambian people. We recognize your sacrifice. Phase one is over. Phase one was to get APRC and YIGM out. That is gone. The Gambia is free forever. You have the liberty to come home. You have the liberty to come home. We fought very hard on principle, principle of democracy. And we are ready to defend that democracy, to make so everybody enjoy the rule of law in this country. The system of the animal farm is gone. whereby more animals are equal than others. <laughs> we don't want that system again in this country. To be part of the opposition in this country for the past 22 years is very, very risky. More or else to become a candidate, presidential candidate for that matter. But with your support, that keep us going. With your support, it makes us very, very strong. So we have no words to express what you did for the Gambia. But phase two is to develop the Gambia. Make us move forward. There will be a lot of reforms in this country where the system is completely polluted. We need reforms in this country. In those reforms, I think some of you have the expertise, the knowledge and the experience to come home and join us in those reforms. Good evening. I have a real honor to introduce my brother my friend, and also a mentor, Dr. Paul Tiyambe Zeleza, who is currently the Vice President of Academic Affairs and Professor of History at Quinnipiac University, Hamden, Connecticut. He came to Quinnipiac after serving as Dean of the Bellarmine College of Liberal Arts and President's Professor of History and African American Studies at Loyola Marymount University. Prior to that, he was head of the Department of African American Studies and the Liberal Arts and Sciences Distinguished Professor at the University of Illinois, Chicago. He taught at the Pennsylvania State University and was director of the Center for African Studies and Professor of History and African Studies at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Before coming to the US in 1995, he was college principal and professor of history and development studies at Trent University in Ontario, Canada. Previously, he worked at universities in Malawi, Jamaica, and Kenya. He held the title of honorary professor at the University of Cape Town, South Africa. 
Professor Zeleza has worked as a consultant for the Ford and MacArthur Foundations and as an advisor to the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development. His research project on the African academic diaspora conducted for the Carnegie Corporation of New York between 2011 and 12 led to the establishment of the Carnegie African Diaspora Fellows in 2013. Thanks to his vision, the project is set to sponsor up to 100 African-born university, sorry, African-born academics in the US and Canada to work with African institutions. I'm one of the beneficiaries of this fellowship. And there are many of us in this room who are beneficiaries. He is a past president of the African Studies Association he has raised millions of dollars in personal research projects and for institutional development. In July 2014, he was recognized by the Carnegie Corporation as one of 43 great immigrants in the United States, North African immigrant, immigrants. In May 2015, he will be awarded an honorary doctor of laws, honoris causa, at Dalhousie University for Outstanding Personal Achievement. Dr. Zeleza Hand is BA with distinction from the University of Malawi and an MA from the University of London, where he studied African history and international relations. He holds his PhD in economic history from Dalhousie University in Nova, uh, Nova Scotia. Dr. Zeleza's academic work has crossed traditional boundaries ranging from economic and intellectual history to human rights, gender studies, and diaspora studies. He has published more than 300 journal articles, book chapters, reviews, short stories, and online essays. And he has also authored or edited 27 books, several of which have won international awards, including Africa's most prestigious book prize, the Norma Award for his books, A Modern Economic History of Africa, and Manufacturing African Studies and Crisis, 1997. His most recent books include In Search of African Diasporas, Testimonies and Encounters, 2012. There's one coming soon titled Africa's Resurgence, Domestic, Global, and Diaspora Transformations. Professor Zeleza has presented nearly 250 keynote addresses, papers, and public lectures at leading universities. <laughs> and he has done this in more than 31 countries. He, also served on the, he has also served on the editorial boards of more than two dozen journals and book series. Between 2004 and 12, he edited a personal online magazine titled The Zelesa Post. This evening, speaking on the role of the diaspora in Africa's economic and political transformations, I am very, very delighted to present my brother, my mentor, and a great friend, Dr. Paul Tuyambe Zelesa. <laughs> First of all, let me thank Akin for that absolutely wonderful introduction. I'd also like to thank Professor Toin Falola, uh, who I call my elder brother, uh, for the opportunity to come and share with you uh, some ideas about the role of the diaspora. Uh, Toin and I have known each other for a quarter century uh, when he was in Toronto at York University and I was at uh, Trent, and we've maintained a robust friendship, comradeship, uh, since that time, and I'm particularly delighted that uh, uh, I'm finally able to participate in what has become an institution, this conference. So thanks to Professor Toin Falola. I'd also like to thank the uh, other people who've been involved in the organization of what uh, is really a very robust, wonderful uh, conference. 
Uh, today, I'm going to share with you um, uh, some thoughts as to the role of the diaspora in Africa's political and economic transformations. And much of what I'm going to say, if I can uh, do a little bit of ad advertising, is from a book I just published called uh, Africa's Resurgence, Domestic, Global, and Diaspora Transformations. I'm going to do uh, four things. First of all, share with you very broadly uh, what the narrative, what the discourse is on Africa rising or rising Africa. And then secondly, look at some of the uh, you know, factors behind this, including, of course, the domestic transformations that are taking place, uh, and then the uh, global uh, repositioning that uh, is going on with regards to Africa, and then end with a discussion of the role of the diaspora. The narratives of Africa, uh, Africa rising or rising Africa uh, indicate the shift uh, in discourses on Africa in the 1980s and 1990s uh, that were characterized by Afro-pessimism to a kind of Afro-optimism, in fact, in some cases, Afro-euphoria. And this is uh, evident uh, in three sets of arenas. First of all, in the media, uh, in, you, a lot of you might recall in May 2000, The Economist published a cover story called The Hopeless Continent. In October 2008, it published an, uh, a lead article, There is Hope. And then in December 2011, it published a cover story, Africa Rising. The economist narrative is emblematic of the shifting narrative on Africa. And you see this repeated in other financial media, uh, for example, uh, the you know, African business, and so on and so forth. Secondly, this narrative is evident in the international management consulting industry. For example, McKinsey and Company, in 2010, published a very influential report called Lions on the Move, the Progress and Potential of African Economies. Thirdly, this narrative is, is evident uh, among the international financial institutions and development industry. For example, the World Bank, the African Development Bank, the IMF, um, have been uh, publishing a lot of upbeat stories about Africa's economic growth and potential. In May 2014, the IMF uh, had a conference in Maputo called Africa Rising, Building to the Future. And to quote the uh, conference um, advertisement, to take stock of Africa's strong economic performance, its increased resilience to shocks, and the key ongoing economic policy challenges, end of quote. A lot of critics, however, question the sustainability and impact on inequality and poverty reduction. I'll give you two examples. The Africa, uh, African Progress Panel Report, uh, published in 2012, and that panel uh, group, of course, is headed by the former UN Secretary General, uh, Mr. Kofi Annan, uh, as well as Afrobarometer, that does surveys across the continent, it produced a report uh, entitled Africa Rising, question mark, popular dissatisfaction with economic management despite a decade of growth. My argument in the book is that Africa's resurgence is neither a myth nor a reality, Ra uh, a narrative neither of boundless hope or irredeemable hopelessness. Rather, our role as intellectuals, as scholars on Africa, is to try to understand the complex and contradictory processes of domestic, global, and diaspora transformations whose trajectory is as much dimensional as it is unpredictable. What are the manifestations of this resurgence, Africa rising narrative? I'll give you four uh, usual uh, uh, 
dis, uh, ways in which people try to demonstrate that. First of all, since 2002, it has been pointed out, Africa has grown consistently above the average rates for the world and the developed countries. It was the only region to register growth at the height of the global financial crisis in 2009 and boasted the world's fastest growth rate in 2012 and 2013. Secondly, Africa's growth, it seems to be more broad-based and increasingly less dependent on primary commodities. Despite falling commodity prices this year, for example, the World Bank reckons that Africa's economy will expand by almost 5%. Telecommunications, transportation, and finance are all expected to spur economic growth. Third, 10 years ago, almost all FDI, foreign direct investment, went to resource-rich African countries. Now, resource-poor economies outpace the latter when investment is measured as a share of GDP. Foreign investors from other African countries are especially keen on non-commodity industries. Nearly a third of their investments are in financial services. Finally, the number of African countries classified as middle income rose from 13 in 2006 to 21 in 2013. And 10 more countries are expected to attend this status by 2025 on current trends. The size of the middle class in many countries has also grown. In assessing Africa's growth, however, it is important to point out that despite these striking economic strides since 2000, serious challenges remain, especially in the following areas. Translating economic growth into decent job opportunities. Second, improving service delivery. Third, minimizing income, gender, and spatial inequalities. Many African governments have failed to convert the wealth created by economic growth into the opportunities that all Africans can exploit to build a better life. There, there is a glaring mismatch between economic growth and inclusive development, which continues and can be blamed or attributed to six key factors. One, the inability to unleash what some call the green and blue revolutions of agriculture and fishing. Two, incapacity to cope effectively with the effects of climate change. Third, underdeveloped domestic financial systems. Fourth, perversive corruption and the damaging consequences of plunder by foreign interests. Five, exceedingly low rates of Africa's of a global value chain reflecting the continent's limited industrialization and continued dependence on natural resources and export of raw materials. Finally, many African countries are held back by low domestic capacity in terms of skills, productive capacity, poor infrastructure, and the business, uh, the business environment. I argue in my book at length, and of course I'm not going to bore you with the details, that turning growth into development will require concerted efforts in a number of areas. Those of us who were in grad school in the 1970s remember the debate about growth and development, that growth does not automatically lead to development. For, Africa, uh, for Africa's long-term development, uh, it, it will require, at a minimum, these three conditions. Increasing intra-African trade and raising the global value chain of Africa's industrial and service sectors. Secondly, in the short term, the, uh, this requires the construction of democratic developmental states. Finally, in the long term, it is imperative for Africa to establish integrated, inclusive, and innovative societies and states, without which African countries will not realize their full potential as they will continue 
to pay the heavy economic costs of suboptimal growth, the political price of inequality generated conflicts, and the deficits of entrepreneurial and creative inertia. How do scholars, including myself, try to explain the dynamics of Africa's transformation in the last two decades? As I indicated in terms of the title of my own book, I think there are three sets of forces we have to look at in trying to understand these changes, which, as I said, are complex and contradictory. First of all, there are the various domestic transformations taking place. Secondly, the restructuring of Africa's global engagements. And finally, Africa's deepening engagements with its diasporas. In terms of the domestic transformations, I'll point out to four. One within a little more detail, the other two in passing. The first one is that there's been greater intra-African engagements economically in terms of at least two indicators, trade and investment. The, if you look at trade, the annual growth rate of intra-African trade averaged 13.5% between 2000 and 2010. According to the African Development Bank, and I quote, the trade was valued at almost 81 billion in 2012, and it is growing faster than Africa's exports to the rest of the world, end of quote. Secondly, there's been growth of intra-African investments. The share of foreign direct investment uh, projects in Africa with other African countries as their source reached 22.8% in 2013 from 8% in 2007, 16% in 2009. Intra-African investment is now second only to Western Europe as a source for FDI on the continent. Intra-African investments are also the second largest source of job creation on the continent. South Africa is the most, the most active intra-African investor followed by countries like Nigeria, Morocco, Kenya, Mauritius, and so on. Thirdly, the, the, the growth of intra-African trade and investment is, is encouraged or facilitated by improving regional value chains and strengthening regional integration with all the challenges of that project. The second set of changes have to do with the social economic changes going across Africa, of course, in different ways, different levels of magnitude. There are three that I want to call your attention to. The first is population growth. Africa had 1.1 billion people in 2013, representing 15.5% of the world's population. By 2050, Africa is expected to have 2.4 billion people representing 25% of the world's population. By the end of the century, Africa on current trends is expected to have 40%, uh, 4 billion people, or 40% of the world's population. Whether this will be a developmental boon or a Methusian nightmare will depend on the rate and patterns of Africa's growth and development over the next few decades. Secondly, urbanization. African cities are growing at breakneck speed at a rate of 3.6% per annum, double the world average. Currently, about 40% of African peoples live in urban environments. But by 2030, the number will exceed 50% as Africa ceases to be a predominantly rural continent, and some cities are expected to swell by up to 85% of their current size. Africa's major cities are emerging as hotspots of investment, consumption, and growth. But again, whether they become transformative engines of development or cesspools of slums and squalor will also depend on the rates and patterns of economic growth and development and urbanization. Finally, in terms of domestic transformations, the growth of African middle classes. 
The African Development Bank, in its report, The Middle of the Pyramid, Dynamics of the Middle Class in Africa, estimated that in 2010, 34% of the African population was middle class and projected in another report uh, entitled African 50 Years Time, The Road Towards Inclusive Growth, that the middle class would reach 42% or 1.1 billion people uh, by 2050. There are, of course, a lot of debates as to how you measure the middle class. Uh, so it depends what kinds of measurements you're using, and a lot of people have critiqued the African Development Bank methodology. The third set of factors that are very important for us, obviously, to understand uh, in terms of domestic transformation is democratization and the development of more vocal civil societies and social movements. We all know, of course, some countries move two steps forward and three steps back in terms of democratization. But there is no question that today's Africa has much more vibrant social movements than the Africa of the 1980s. And certainly, the election in Nigeria just a few days ago demonstrates some of these very complicated political transformations that are taking place with regards to democratization and development of more vocal civil societies. Finally, um, re there's been a reduction in some of the continent's most debilitating wars and conflicts. Of course, we all know conflict continues in many parts of the continent, but nothing on the scale of what happened or was happening in the 1980s and 1990s. I would like now to look at the restructuring of Africa's global engagements as a segue to looking at the diaspora. There have been important shifts in the global economy, at least since 2000. And of course, we historians can go further behind, uh, further back than that, but I'm looking at the period since 2000. And one can identify two major trends in the global political economy. First of all, the declining dominance of the Western economies that has been accelerated by the Great Recession. Secondly, the growing importance of the emerging economies as represented by the rise of the BRICS, and some people you know, uh, also uh, uh, coin other groupings, like the Mint, Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria, and Turkey. Um, people you know, uh, derive a lot of pleasure in coining these labels. But the point is that emerging economies are playing a much greater role in the global economy than was the case two decades ago. Africa's globalization in the last decade and a half represents, uh, represented by the expanding and shifting range and dynamics of relations with the Western and emerging economies, in my view, is one of the major developments of the 21st century. Although serious questions remain about the contribution to sustainable development of the current forms of integration of many African economies into the global economy. Africa's uh, total investment, uh, uh, FDI, as a percent of GDP increased uh, remarkably uh, after 2000. Foreign direct investment into Africa rose by 5% in 2012 and 10% in 2013, despite global stagnation. I'd like to just make a few comments uh, in particular on the BRICS, uh, which of course um, there's uh, now a very large and growing literature. Three observations can be made about the rise of the BRICS. First, since the 1990s, the BRICS have been growing much faster than the developed countries, so that their share and importance for the global economy uh, has, uh, has risen while those of the Western economies, including the United States and the European Union, have fallen, uh, signaling, according to some people, a historic shift in the direction of the world economy. Secondly, the BRICS and other emerging markets largely were not hit as hard by the global financial crisis as the Western economies, suggesting, according to some analysts, a decoupling in their growth trajectories. Third, growing interaction between the emerging markets is a major factor in their economic expansion. This is clearly evident for Africa, whose growth 
has become less dependent on the developed economies and increasingly driven by relations with the BRICS and other emerging economies. If you look at the characteristics of the BRICS, um, some of the following are particularly important, elaborating on the point I just made. Uh, the BRICS, in terms of their, their share of the world's population and the land mass, uh, they account for 40% of the world's population and 25% of the world's land mass. If you look at their patterns of growth collectively, the relative share of the BRICS of world GDP increased by some 3.6 times from 1990 to 2012, so that they accounted for 56% of world GDP growth over these uh, two, uh, two and a half decades. By 2012, the BRICS claimed about 20% of world GDP compared to 24% for the European Union and 21% for the United States, and they claimed 43% of world reserves of foreign exchange. Thirdly, the BRICS increased their share of total world trade to 21.3% as compared to 25% for the European Union and 27% for the United States. And both for the EU and the US, they're declining from what they used to be. The BRICS, of course, face enormous challenges. And for me, some of the key challenges are as follows. First, there are disproportionalities among the BRICS in terms of the size of their populations, economies, and trading prowess. China overwhelms all the BRICS combined. Secondly, there are significant differences in their constitutional and institutional arrangements in terms of levels of statism, participatory government, rule of law, enforcement, and private sector participation in the economy. Third, they lack an adequate in internal system of regulation of competition and dispute resolution. There are a lot of conflicts among the BRICS. Four, there is limited diversity in the trade and investment behavior of several of the BRICS. And finally, their future growth prospects will depend on the extent to which they resolve the problems of growing domestic inequalities and accelerate their capacities for innovation. For example, we are already seeing the Brazilian economy in stagnation. What are the benefits and the challenges of the BRICS for Africa? The BRICS have had four major, uh, they have presented Africa with four major opportunities and also four major challenges. The first opportunity is that these emerging partners have presented Africa enhanced opportunities for trade and investment. Secondly, they have offered higher commodity prices and enhanced competition for African resources. Fourth, the BRICS have invested heavily in African infrastructure and industry shunned by the West. Fourth, they have forced the major economic powers including the European Union, Japan, and the United States to rethink their engagement with Africa. And we saw in the case of the United States last August, the first summit, Africa-US summit in Washington, Washington DC. The Chinese have been doing that for 20 years. What are the pitfalls of the BRICS for Africa? First, the threat of reversal of democratic governance and human rights gains. Second, the undermining of African environmental, labor, and safety standards. Third, the dangers of mortgaging the future and selling short Africa's natural resources by corrupt officials. Finally, there is little evidence thus far that the BRICS have assisted in integrating African economies in global value chains different from what the patterns have historically been. Of the BRICS, some of the most important relations, and I'll just run through the figures just to give you a sense of the magnitude of the growth of trade and investment with these three particular countries, China, India, and Brazil. 
the volume of Africa-China trade is simply, in, in terms of its growth is simply staggering. It grew from 2.4 billion in 1992 to almost 10 billion by 2000 and 41 billion by 2005, 128.5 billion by 2010, and almost 200 billion by 2012. And in 2013, it had uh, reached 210 billion. China overtook the United States as Africa's largest trading partner in 2009. And this year, on current trends, some projections are that China will overtake the European Union as Africa's largest trading bloc uh, when the trade is supposed to reach a staggering 300 $85 billion from 2.4 20 years ago. In 1990, China's cumulative foreign direct investment in Africa totaled a mere $49 million. This rose to $1.6 billion by 2000, and by 2012, it had reached $21.2 billion. Again, exponential growth in Chinese FDI. Africa-India relations have also grown at breakneck speed. Trade between Africa, African countries, and India um, rose from $1 billion in 1990 to $3 billion in 2000 to almost 10 billion in 2005, 35 billion in 2009, 57 billion by 2011, and this year is supposed to reach between 75 to 90 billion dollars, from one to 90 in 25 years. The scale of Indian investments in Africa has also grown rapidly in the last two decades. Some, uh, you have to be very careful with some of these figures. Some indications are that uh, by 2010, Indian investment may have reached as much as um, 90 billion, although it's very hard, as I said, to be very sure of some of these data. Africa-Brazil relations uh, has also been a story of exponential growth. Total trade between Brazil and Africa increased from about 4 billion in 2000 to 20 billion in 2010 and reached 27 billion in 2011. Investment in sub Saharan Africa alone from Brazil rose from 29 billion or had reached 29 billion by 2010. The following year, the figure had reached 37 billion. So, what you can see is this massive engagement. Uh, between Africa, African countries and the BRICS. And of course, uh, in my book, I also look at others, Turkey, Singapore, and so on and so forth. I would like now to uh, conclude by looking at Africa's engagement with its diaspora. I'm going to do uh, a number of things. First of all, look at the dynamics of diaspora contributions, what some of the literature theoretically tells us are the issues that we want to pay attention to. And then look at specific aspects of diaspora engagements, focusing largely on economic engagements, although I'll make some uh, allusions to political engagements. In looking at the diaspora, uh, the dynamics of diaspora contributions, not just about Africa, but in general among diasporans, um, to, 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 to the development of their countries of origin, it is evident that this involves a variety of activities, economic, political, social, and cultural, channeled through formal and informal networks in the homeland, the hostland, and the international system. Secondly, diaspora contributions to development can both be direct and indirect, and undertaken by individuals and groups, 
located in the hostland, the homeland, or organized through transnational networks. Third, diasporas are motivated by voluntary as well as profit considerations in engaging their homelands. While individual activities are important, especially for remittances, diaspora engagements are most efficacious through collective organization. Fourth, diaspora organizations can include a whole range of uh, groups from hometown associations, ethnic associations, alumni associations, religious as associations, professional associations, development NGOs, investment business groups, national development groups, welfare refugee groups, uh, supplementary schools, and virtual organizations. Finally, it is clear the question of diaspora and development involves three interconnected dynamics. Development in the diaspora, development through the diaspora, and development by the diaspora. As a result of the growing importance of diaspora engagements, there's been rising recognition of diaspora in development discourse. Not only have diasporas become more conscious of their power and potential, interest in the role of diaspora, in, in the role of diasporas has increased among governments in both the sending and receiving countries and among international organizations from the United Nations and its various agencies, including the World Bank and the International Organization for Migration. In 2008, the African Union, for example, launched the AU Health Initiative involving the diaspora. And two years later, it established the African Remittance Institute to mobilize diaspora human and financial resources for the continent's development. The inclusion by host governments humanitarian organizations and international agencies of migrants and diasporas in development efforts in their homelands is sometimes referred to as co-development. The reasons for this growing interest in diaspora contributions to development uh, relate to uh, what somebody calls the four R's, remittances, return, resources, and reputation. The volume of remittances from the diasporas often exceeds official development assistance. And I'll show that momentarily with regards to Africa. Secondly, return migration, whether temporarily, permanent, or circulatory, turns brain drain into brain, grain, uh, brain gain into brain circulation. Diaspora, diasporas possess multifaceted resources that need to be better mobilized and deployed. Finally, diasporas tend to display dual loyalties to their countries of origin and settlement. Engaging them effectively has reputational benefits for all involved. It is increasingly appreciated that engaging and mainstreaming diasporas in development work uh, effectively involves several strategies. Five tend to be emphasized in the literature. Through first knowledge building activities that include research and mapping exercises and pilot projects. Second, strengthening di uh, diaspora technical and organizational capacities through training and knowledge exchange programs and networking initiatives. Third, supporting the organic formation of, rather than imposing, umbrella diaspora organizations. Fourth, maximizing diaspora participation in terms of partnership selection procedures, funding schemes, and forging eco, not paternalistic, or token collaborations in project development and implementation. Finally, actively including diasporas, by recruiting diaspora individuals in development agencies, which brings diversity, and developing formal consultation processes with diaspora associations. 
the diversity uh, of, uh, you know, diasporas obviously bring diversity to these uh, organizations and that fosters innovation uh, in, uh, in often homogeneous development agencies and practices. Thus, in short, previously negative views of diasporas and development of the developmental impact of migration have been tempered by growing appreciation of the diaspora's benefits. Although a lot remains to be done to improve understanding of these processes and promoting policy coherence and coordination and international dialogue and cooperation. Because of the uh, evident economic and political clout of many diasporas, governments are increasingly county, uh, uh, courting them by creating agencies and even ministries of diaspora affairs. The growing recognition of the diaspora as part of the domestic political community is concretely manifested by conferring upon them dual citizenship and all the rights that this might entail, including voting rights and political representation in state parliaments, as well as preferential investment options and, and, uh, and other economic and social privileges accorded to uh, uh, resident national citizens. According to one survey, by 2007, there were 115 states worldwide and uh, independent territories that allowed citizens abroad to vote in domestic elections. By 2010, 15 African countries had set up diaspora-related institutions and ministries in order to deal more professionally with diaspora-led development-related issues. Several African countries currently allow dual citizenship. They include Egypt, South Africa, and Ghana and others are in the process of introducing legislation to that effect. In 2004, the African Union recognized the diaspora as Africa's sixth region, the only continental body uh, to recognize the diaspora as part of the uh, continent. Uh, the other five, of course, being North, West, East, Central, and Southern Africa. What are the forms of diaspora contributions? Diaspora engagements with their homelands are often complex, contradictory, and always changing, so that it is hard to make generalizations about the behavior and activities of any particular diaspora. Diaspora communities, like all communities, are highly differentiated um, according to the social inscriptions of gender, class, ethnicity, religion, ideology, you name it. In terms of economic contributions, the range of economic contributions from the diaspora include at least four um, uh, dimensions. One, remittances. Two, philanthropy. Three, human capital. Four, investment. I'll talk about this in a, uh, in a while. Uh, the political Contributions of the diaspora uh, are also or can also be quite significant. The diaspora can exert significant political influence, both positive and negative, on both their countries of origin and residence, and through international institutions like the, the United Nations, through protest, public relations campaigns, and diplomatic pressure. Politically savvy diaspora, diaspora groups use a variety of activities and instruments to mobilize public opinion in the hostland for their causes by working with hostland civil society groups from community-based organizations to non-governmental organizations, traditional social movements, including labor, religious and women's associations, and new social movements ranging from environmental to human rights. Uh, activists. Their tactics cover conventional rallies, marches, and boycotts, and public relations campaigns in the traditional media 
as well as digital mobilization. The mobilizational capacities of the diaspora partly depend on the nature of the hostland's political regime. The more democratic the hostland is, the greater the opportunities, all things being equal, for diaspora active, uh, activists and struggles to exercise diplomatic pressure on the hostland to adopt uh, foreign policies towards the diaspora's homeland that the latter favor. The capacity of diaspora to become influential political constituents, important interest groups in their countries of residence, is often proportional to their political weight in the electoral process. Their ability to affect the outcome of local and national elections, either because of their numbers, resources, uh, or influence. Through diplomatic pressure, diasporas can help legitimize or delegitimize their homeland government and political processes. Diasporas also make enormous social and cultural contributions. In other words, they provide social and cultural capital. And that is attributes and attitudes, skills and sensibilities that can mo be mobilized for the development or underdevelopment of their countries of origin. The social and cultural and professional experiences, values and skills and assets acquired by the diaspora inform their perception and participation in the affairs of their countries of origin. Diasporas located in developed and democratic societies can develop through routine economic, social, cultural, and political activities and practices that can be leveraged for development and democratization in their countries of origin. Moreover, diasporas can be mobilized for the development and the democratization of their homelands. These include knowledge and media networks, cultural institutions, ideologies, and imaginations through which the cultural and social landscape of the, uh, um, of the homeland can be revitalized, globalized, and transformed. The worth of diaspora social and cultural capital in the homelands tend to be realized through civic-oriented activities that enhance the capacities and organizational structures of civil society networks and promoting community-oriented development, social emancipation, empowerment, grassroots political participation, etc. One fascinating area concerns diaspora digital mobilization, the use of the internet and social media to maintain connections, build networks, and for advocacy. Let me conclude with a few remarks on the economic contributions, particularly of the African diaspora to the continent. I mentioned four uh, forms of economic contributions, the first one being remittances. Remittances from the diaspora to Africa and the global south more generally comprise one of the largest streams of foreign capital inflows outpacing development assistance. In 2007, Migrant remittances to the developing countries were estimated at more than $320 billion, double the amount in 2001. Remittances to Africa from the diaspora were estimated at $50 billion in 2007, although the figure is likely to be much higher if remittances through informal channels were included. From 2000 to 2007, remittance flows from the African diaspora to the continent increased by more than 141%. In 2013, the volume of remittances from the African diaspora to the continent reached $65 billion, higher than any other inflow from a single source uh, anywhere. Um, and uh, by the end of last year, it's uh, you know, suspected it may have risen to 67 billion. So the African diaspora is a much bigger economic player 
in Africa than official development assistance. And certainly, more than the mercy industrial complex activities of our stars that seem to derive humanitarian gravitas from African commiseration. The African Development Bank reports that the majority of remittances went uh, to North and West Africa, the regions with the largest number of diaspora communities, receiving nearly 80% of total remittances. Europe accounted for 40% of the remittance inflows, the United States for 28%, and the Middle East for 9%. Intercontinental remittances accounted for 13%. In many African countries, remittances are the most important and stable source of capital inflows, in some cases largely exceeding foreign direct investment and uh, overseas development assistance. For example, in Morocco, remittances make up 673% of foreign direct uh, investment in Morocco and 425% of ODA. For Egypt, it's 467% of FDI, 225% of ODA. In Cape Verde, 929% of FDI and 103% of ODA. And you can do that for all sorts of countries. What motivates the diasporas to remit these huge resources? Occasionally, remittances are generated by coercive means, when home governments impose demands for remittances. There is a, a country on the continent that does that with its diaspora. In so far, uh, secondly, insofar as migration decisions are often part of an explicit or implicit contract between the migrant and the remaining household, migrant or diaspora remittances are part of enlightened self-interest. Diaspora send them to improve consumption levels of family members in anticipation of reciprocal assistance as part of core insurance arrangements or to repair loans and investments in their human capital. Whatever the source or motivation, diaspora remittances increasingly play a crucial role in sustaining their livelihoods, basic services, and economic growth in many African countries. Financial transfers occur through, of course, formal channels. Uh, I don't know a friend who doesn't know where Western Union is located, <laughs> or MoneyGram. And uh, of course, if you send really large sums, the banks. And this has raised all sorts of issues in diaspora communities in Europe, African diaspora communities in Europe and North America, about um, the high fees and demands for tax relief, uh, that maybe these diaspora remittances should be, you know, should be um, uh, regarded as taxable uh, philanthropic contributions. Uh, that's more advanced in Europe than in the US. They also occur through the informal sector and informal means. We all know sending our friend going home, uh, you know, give them an envelope to deliver to the family when they get there. The second form is philanthropy and human capital. The diaspora can also serve as a major philanthropic player in its own right, or in helping to mobilize philanthropy in their countries of residence for their countries uh, of origin. Diaspora philanthropy organizations are particularly important for subsequent uh, diaspora generations who may not enjoy direct family and social connections in the homeland that the first generation enjoys. That's why the latter, that is the people like me and Professor Toin Falola, uh, dominate remittance flows. The historic diaspora and our children increasingly play a much greater role in philanthropic uh, flows to the homeland. And the homeland usually is not even just the country of origin. It could be Africa, it could be the region, it could be anything. For many African countries, their overseas diasporas cons uh, constitutes 
one of the largest sources of human capital for development. Africa suffers from the world's highest rates of skilled labor emigration. Homeland governments and international development agencies have increasingly come to value the potential of the diaspora communities and expertise for development. The deployment of diaspora human capital often involves repatriation, which can be permanent, temporary, or circulatory in nature. Diaspora circulation often involves what some call homeland tourism and return visits. One can also think of the mobilization of this capital in both physical and virtual modes. Again, a lot of us are involved in all sorts of human capital development activities in the areas of our expertise. Academics, we work with fellow academics on the continent in terms of research, uh, you know, curriculum, teaching, and so on and so forth. So the role of the academic diaspora is important. And uh, he mentioned a, project, a program that uh, we established with the Carnegie Corporation of New York to mobilize the African academic diaspora specifically to engage with African higher education institutions in a number of areas that make a difference, both to the continent and to the diaspora. Then there is, of course, investment. Diaspora economic outlays to the homeland sometimes go beyond remittances, philanthropy, or repatriation or human capital flows. It can involve various levels and forms of business investment as well. Diasporas often possess deep, effective capital for their homelands. Their commitment tends to be long-term. They are more likely than other investors to think of out of the box, and they can harness long-term contacts in the homeland. Diaspora investment decisions are based on expectations of financial, emotional, and social status returns. Thus, diasporas exhibit strong country of origin bias and a sense of origin country duty, derive psychic income, as somebody puts it, from investing in the homeland. And this raises their status, both in the diaspora as well as back home. Diaspora investments can range from purchasing equity or lending to local businesses to direct investment in industry and services. Diasporas can also serve as reputational intermediaries and provide transnational linkages for businesses in the host land for the homeland. The, I remember there was a conference in 2007 at Kennesaw State University in which the Kenyan government sent a very large delegation, including executives and uh, the Minister of Finance and others, to engage the Kenyan diaspora. And the Kenyan business leaders told the diasporans that instead of trying to build a house in their home village, which they will never go back to, and which typically they send money to their brother or cousin, who then sends them pictures of the house being built, only to find when they go back that actually nothing actually happened. That they might be better off investing their resources on the Nairobi Stock Exchange. In conclusion, what is the impact of diaspora contributions? The impact of diaspora contributions is neither uniformly positive no negative, but variable, depending on the specific context. The inflows of remittances, philanthropy, and human capital and investment capital from the diasporas are inherently contradictory. Remittances are insufficient to compensate for the losses of human capital from Africa in the first place. Their benefits are also selective. They carry with them social and cultural baggage. They can increase dependency, engender economic distortions, deepen social and regional inequalities, which may hinder development, 
because they are unpredictable and are undependable and encourage the consumption of goods with high import content. Diasporas do not control how their resources might be used in the homeland, which may be channeled toward conflict. In fact, a lot of diasporas, African diasporas included, have bankrolled conflicts on the continent. Diaspora philanthropy and remittance of human capital may have some of the same potentially negative effects. Diaspora attitudes and attitudes towards them may introduce new or reinforce old class stratifications, resentments, and divisions. Returning diasporans sometimes exhibit insufferable superiority complexes and project a developmentalist mentality, almost bordering on charity, which is deeply resented. Also, elites and even ordinary people in the homeland harbor their own complexes and resentments against the diasporans for abandoning the homeland when it was in crisis, especially the diasporas that are generated by crisis. Um, such friction and hostility can exact a toll on development efforts by delaying or thwarting them altogether. So once again, the developments taking place in the continent, I'd like to leave you with one idea. They're extraordinarily complicated, contradictory, and changing very quickly. Thank you. Thank you.